On June 10th, 2002, more than 12 million people tuned into Coronation Street to see the return of street legend and soap icon Bette Lynch, played by Julie Goodyear, after a high-profile departure from seven years previously. What resulted was one of the show's biggest embarrassments, with the press savaging both the storyline and the actress, turning what was meant to be a permanent return into a two-week stint. It's long been relegated to nothing more than an awkward misstep for the show, but I think there's more significance to it than that. At heart, the decision to bring back Bette Lynch is a story of Britain's biggest soap and one of Britain's biggest soap actresses panicking during mutual weak points and trying and failing to return to a long gone golden era. I'm sorry but it's very clear Sarah Louise is pregnant. She's 13 years old! To understand why Bette Lynch returned in 2002, we first have to understand the position Coronation Street found itself in at the turn of the millennium. And to understand this, we have to look at the woman at the helm of the show. Jane McNaught's career and rise to executive producer really is quite baffling. She became a producer of Coronation Street in 1999 and moved to executive producer in 2000, but prior to that had had no drama showrunning experience whatsoever. And on the whole, her television experience seems pretty scant. In fact, the only truly relevant experience McNaught had was producing some behind-the-scenes Coronation Street specials. Compare this with McNaught's predecessors, most of whom worked as writers or produced long-running shows for a time before moving to Coronation Street, with a fair few even having experience producing other soaps. However, what McNaught lacked in experience, she made up for in vision. With Coronation Street turning 40 years old and entering the 21st century, McNaught had a very clear idea of where she wanted to take the show. Her strategy was to drastically increase the number of issue-based storylines and to make Coronation Street grittier to better compete with EastEnders. With high-profile events such as weddings, funerals, major story points and revelations taking place at a rate of around once per month to keep the show in the headlines, it was a strategy that would only take her so far. The vision paid dividends to begin with. McNaught's greatest triumph, and probably the greatest storyline of her era, came in February 2000, when 13-year-old Sarah Lou Platt, Tina O'Brien, discovered that she was pregnant. The story capitalised on the prevalence of teenage pregnancy fears that were circulating in Britain at the time, and, despite some criticism from the National Viewers and Listeners Association that the story was turning teenage pregnancy into entertainment, was a ratings and critical hit, winning Best Storyline at the British Soap Awards. The Sarah Platt pregnancy storyline was followed by a slew of similar stories. Gangster and drug dealer Jez Quigley, Lee Boardman, terrorised the street, and Supermarket Fresco was the setting of a hostage situation slash siege, which ended with one of the hostage takers being shot by police. Yes, sir. This is Fred Elliott speaking. You can come up now, it's safe. I've got the gun and the man is on the floor. 2001 saw a continuance of this approach to the show, with one of the bigger storylines that year being the mystery identity of the man who sexually assaulted Toya Battersby. Though the performances were applauded, the decision to frame the storyline as a whodunit led to criticisms of trivialisation and allegations that the storyline was an attempt to repeat the success of EastEnders immensely popular Who Shot Phil plot. Later in the year, long-running character and fan favourite Alma Baldwin, played by Amanda Barry, was killed off after Barry quit the show after 20 years. Alma died six weeks after being diagnosed with terminal cervical cancer, and once again the show was criticised for trivialising a serious subject, Barry herself labelling the move a cheap ratings ploy, given how soon Alma died after being diagnosed. Despite the initial success of the Sarah Platt pregnancy storyline, the issue-based, grittier storyline soon began to grate with viewers. There was a feeling that the show had gotten too dark and too depressing, and that the light-hearted and often comedic tone that had led Coronation Street to such success in the first place had been forgotten. Viewing figures plummeted early. In 2000, ratings suffered their biggest drop in a single year since 1993 dropping over a million views since 1999, and for only the third time in its history, Coronation Street's monthly ratings were lower than the monthly ratings of the year before. 2001 continued this trend. Once more, over a million viewers were lost from the previous year, and again, each month was down from those of the previous year. The real blow, however, comes from the show's placement in the viewing charts. In 1999, 25 episodes were rated number one in the ratings for their time slot. In 2000, it was 21. In 2001, it was down to three, the lowest since the 80s. On August 10th, 2001, Coronation Street and EastEnders faced off in the same time slot for the first time. Usually this was avoided given the assumption that many viewers of one soap would also be viewers of another, and so scheduling both to air at the same time would do nothing but risk harm to both. The result fell decisively in EastEnders' favour, with 13.98 million viewers trouncing Coronation Street's 8.55 million. 
The clash was a result of EastEnders increasing its number of weekly episodes and is indicative of the confidence that the show felt in facing off against its main rival. The storylines EastEnders was putting out at this period rank as some of the greatest in its history. Who Shot Phil, The Death of Ethel, The Arrival of the Slater Family, Frank and Pat's Affair, Trevor's Abuse of Little Mo, Cats Reveal That She's Zoe's Mother. These all came during this period and even if you aren't a fan of soap I can almost guarantee that you're aware of some of these storylines. The contrast between EastEnders and Coronation Street during this time could not be starker, and the fact it was airing four times a week, with an additional omnibus to match Coronation Street's, only served to increase EastEnders' advantage. The issues extended far beyond the ratings, though. McNaught was apparently far from popular on set, having imposed a new pay regime, reduced annual retainers, and imposed stricter contracts. McNaught's lack of approval can be seen most keenly, however, in the writer's room, where three long-term script writers left. Ken Blakeson and Jan McVeary had been writing since 1989 and 1991 respectively, but by far the biggest loss was John Stevenson, who had written almost 300 episodes since he joined in 1976. It was a blow to say the least, and gives us an insight into the attitude of many writers during this time. It didn't help matters that McNaught's tenure as showrunner came at such a pivotal time in Coronation Street's history. The show had been on air for 40 years when McNaught took over. The number of people who had been watching the show when it started was getting thinner and thinner, and there was a need to reach new viewers who didn't necessarily have much experience with Coronation Street. The show needed to evolve properly to secure its future in the new millennium. What's more, ITV was experiencing a 12% slump in ad revenue and fell back on its reliable proven successes, of which soaps were a core component. The pressure was immense. Coronation Street needed to hold its own again, and McNaught was failing to change its fortunes. In October of 2001, McNaught was removed with immediate effect from her post and replaced by Kieran Roberts, who by this point had three years experience in producing EastEnders. A slew of emergency actions followed. A return to the traditional light-hearted tone Coronation Street was known for was made a priority. Then Ken kills me, Fred kills Ken, Peter kills Sam. What? Peter Barlow kills you. But I'm the King's champion! Yes, well it doesn't make you immortal. Stevenson, Blakeson and McVeary were rehired. Five of McNaught's favoured writers were sacked and new, younger writers were brought in, with the writers' room now being allowed more freedom over their scripts and storylines. And, as is tradition when a new showrunner takes over a soap, a character curl soon followed and eight minor characters were written out. The ship was turning. Coronation Street would have navigated the course if given time. Robert's changes were working and the Richard Hillman storyline, arguably the most successful in the show's history, was in its infancy, only a year away from reaching its climax. Coronation Street had a very secure future to look forward to. It's easy to say that from our future perspective though. At the time, the view was very, very different. The rough patch had been so harsh that no measure seemed too extreme. The confidence of the show's higher-ups had been severely dented. The once untouchable Coronation Street was floundering at a critical point, and EastEnders was soundly beating it in the ratings at every turn. What the show needed was to return to its golden age, a safer time when it was secure, back when it was at the height of its powers. The proposed solution was to bring back one of the most iconic characters in Coronation Street and soap history. It was time to bring back Bert Lynch. But he's right about one thing. <laughs> I am in charge. Get it? Got it? Good. <laughs> After first appearing for a few weeks in 1966, Bette Lynch became a fully-fledged member of the cast in 1970, appearing as the new barmaid in The Rover's Return, alongside fellow barmaid Betty Turpin and landlady Annie Walker. Initially, Lynch was introduced as a sex symbol. Many of her costumes were revealing, and, in the early days at least, the show capitalised on her looks constantly, with characters gawking at her and making lewd suggestions towards her that are very of the time. Hi, oh, hey, okay, what? You've been making some improvements in here. You know, the great move was that. Oh, it's sweet, Mrs. Walker, sweet. Pardon? Putting Bet Lynch behind the bar. She's like a beacon. You know, where do those pumps go together like Malcolm and Wise? Like S and X. I'm sorry I'm late, Mrs. Walker. Good heavens. Oh, God, nine. I'll split these things, honest. You get paid extra if you do. Keep your hands to yourself. Lots of emphasis, both on screen and off, was placed on Bet's cleavage. The way the show frames her chest is very 1970s, but even today it's impossible to find a documentary or interview focusing on Bette Lynch that doesn't mention them in some capacity. Now I don't normally ask my female guests about a certain part of their anatomy, but in your case I have to make an exception because they were national institutions. I'm of course talking about Newton your, and Ridley. your Newton and Ridley. <laughs> I knew he was going to say that. Every man in the building, from the producer down to the doorman, had an immediate desire to rip the knickers completely off the woman. She had these fantastic 
bazookas. Great. Big. And that's where Judy came into her own, because let's face it, she has got the best pair of wobbly knockers around. One aspect of Bet Lynch's character that remained throughout her time on the show was the look. Glamour might not be a word you immediately associate with Lynch, but her style was very distinct and almost immediately iconic. Big earrings, bigger beehive and lots of leopard print clothing. It's a hugely recognisable look and we need only look at the drag scene to see its impact, with Bette Lynch remaining as popular an inspiration as ever and Freddie Mercury himself donning Lynchian garb, albeit with a black wig rather than a blonde one, for the music video for I Want to Break Free. After a time, Bette became a more well-rounded character providing comic relief on occasion with the rest of the staff behind the Rover's return bar, often making light of Hilda Ogden's terrible singing voice, mispronunciations and taste. Like a lump of coke stuck under the back gate. Leave her be, Fred. She's happy. Happy? What right has she to be happy? She's been wed to Stanley for 40 years and she's still outside the loony bin. Oh, only just. Wed to Stan. 40 years and him about as much use and comfort to her as a gun barrel. And she's singing. Elder belt up, Chuck, there's a good one. But there was more to Bet than sex and comedy. Coronation Street often explored the vulnerability of the character. Almost all of her relationships ended in heartbreak in one way or another, with lots of affairs and premature deaths. In 1985, Bette Lynch went from barmaid to landlady, serving in the role for ten years. And two years later, in 1987, Bette married businessman and club owner Alec Kilroy. Though the marriage wasn't a typical love story, it did result in one of the best comedic pairings in all of Corey, with a gregarious and generous Bet often clashing with penny-pinching Alex. Bet and Alex managed the Rovers very successfully and eventually became legal guardians to Alex's granddaughter Vicky after her parents were killed in a car crash. In 1992, Alec decided that he wanted to accept a job in Southampton, arguing that Bet had lived her dream as landlady of the Rovers and that now it was his turn. Though she initially agreed, Bet found it impossible to tear herself away from the pub, and the marriage ended with Alec leaving. Three years later, the brewery, Newton and Ridley, which owned the Rovers, decided to sell, and Bet, as landlady, was offered first refusal. Keen to stay on as owner and landlady, Bet tried to raise the funds by appealing to her old friend Rita Sullivan, played by Barbara Knox. Once Rita confirmed she wouldn't be taking the chance, the pair had a fierce argument, and Bet, now unable to buy the Rovers, and facing the humiliating loss of her home and job, decided to leave quietly on her own terms leaving in the back of a taxi for passengers new. Single women, they always go where the sun shine. Do they find it? Ah, well, can't answer that one, love. Oh, they do, you know. They all find it sooner or later. Sort of hard to see now living in a post Peggy Mitchell world, but there was once a time where Bette Lynch was the definitive soap landlady. Bette had the security of rising in fame during the show's greatest height, back when 20 million people were regularly tuning in. And for many people, Bette Lynch simply was Coronation Street. Bette was a classic Coronation Street matriarch, powerful and tough, but also willing to be a shoulder to cry on and offer advice. All while putting a brave face on her own troubles, because it was what our punters expected. Bette Lynch really was the biggest soap star of her day, and much of it is down to the woman who played her. Julie Goodyear, this is your life. Oh, oh. <laughs> is it going to be a series? <laughs> From the moment Julie Goodyear saw the first episode of Coronation Street, she knew what she wanted to do. I remember looking at Coronation Street, going out and thinking, that's mine. I'm having that. In 1966, after six years of hard work honing her craft and gaining acting experience, Julie Goodyear was cast as factory worker Bette Lynch. Despite being overjoyed at the chance to work on Coronation Street, within six weeks her contract had ended and Goodyear had to leave. For a time it must have seemed like the dream was dead, but after being advised by Elsie Tanner actress and then Queen of the Street, Pat Phoenix, to seek more experience, Goodyear joined a theatre company and did some more television work for Granada. Four years later, in 1970, Julie Goodyear was asked to return to the street. The contract was for six months. She would stay for a quarter of a century. One of the things that becomes clear about Julie Goodyear is that she has an excellent work ethic and a strong sense of professionalism, stemming largely from the desire to remain on Coronation Street at all cost, at least in the early days. Her autobiography, Just Julie, makes it very clear that Goodyear went out of her way not to ruffle any feathers. She did exactly what she was told when she was told and played complete deference to bigger and more established cast members. I was determined it was going to be long lasting. There was no way they were going to throw me out again. No way. Whatever I had to do, if they said jump, I said how high. 
I, I, this was where I wanted to be and where I would stay. In one particularly memorable moment, Gojira relates how she was called into the dressing room of the august and stately Doris Speed, who played first Rover's landlady Annie Walker, only to be given formal permission that she could now refer to her as Doris rather than Miss Speed. As Goodyear says, It was not the done thing then to be familiar with others. It was all Miss Carson and Miss Speed and all that. I was very much a newcomer and expected to know my place. I totally understood and respected that. I accepted that I had to earn my stripes before I would even be able to enter into a conversation. It was very much a speak when spoken to situation. Working your way up and woe betide any newcomer who, even without knowing it, sat in an established cast member's chair. Another thing that really stands out about Goodyear is how committed she was to getting Bet's characterisation right. She talks about trawling markets with Coronation Street creator Tony Warren and Granada makeup artist Lois Richardson and looking for both inspiration and costume pieces, taking note of women who had Bet-like quality to them and incorporating aspects of their look into Bet herself. It wasn't just the look that was worked on. Goodyear also took her craft seriously, fine-tuning her performance and picking up hints and tricks from other actors, including Sir Laurence Olivier, with whom she enjoyed a brief friendship. I don't think you can really understand Julie Goodyear without understanding this dedication. The biggest indicator of Julie Goodyear's commitment is the evolution of Bette as a character. If any other actress was playing Bet Lynch, then it's likely she'd be relegated to nothing more than a footnote in Coronation Street history. A minor character, introduced in an attempt to sex up the show. If Bette became an icon, then it's almost entirely down to Julie Goodyear. Of course, it helps that she's a natural entertainer. She can't seem to help herself. It is just in that woman's bones to play to an audience. I've yet to see an interview with her where she wasn't performing at some point. There were thousands, and I mean thousands, of drag queens, all with beehives, all in leopard. I'll tell you what really pissed me off a bit, though. Most of them looked better than I bloody did. However... In the 70s and 80s, the tabloids began to realise that soap stars were a very viable and very lucrative source of stories, and that their immense popularity meant any scandal involving them would sell papers. As the biggest star in soap, Goodyear was naturally a target, but the real reason for her popularity with the tabloids was her colourful private life. Her bisexuality, her four marriages, a battle with cervical cancer, mental health difficulties, and her relationship with Britain's first out gay footballer, Justin Fashionu all became good fodder for the papers. Few other soap stars really got as much press attention as she did, and it all helped to make her as big an icon as she was. Coronation Street was the core of Judy Goodyear's life. She not only loved it deeply, but felt a great responsibility towards it. She ensured every bit of fan mail she received was replied to, and when children sent her earrings in the mail, she endeavoured to wear them on screen as soon as possible. The show returned the favour, marking the first time in her life that Goodyear felt financially secure. She was friendly with her cast, famous across the country, had achieved her greatest ambition, and was fulfilled in almost every aspect of her life because of Coronation Street. Still, it couldn't last forever. In 1992, Goodyear decided to leave Coronation Street but remained a further three years at the behest of the producers. It wasn't an easy decision. By her own testimony, it was the hardest thing she'd ever done. But Goodyear was keen to leave at her height, before she grew too old for other opportunities. And having been the biggest star in a soap that regularly brought in 20 million viewers an episode, there wasn't much higher decline. Julie Goodyear left Granada Studios after filming her final episode to massive crowds of fans and well-wishers, and the ratings were excellent, with over 19 million tuning in. But with the end of an era for Coronation Street, came time for Julie Goodyear to begin the next phase of her career. The next phase never really came. In 1996, she signed an advertising deal for Shredded Wheat. And very tasty. The biggest project she undertook was her very own chat show, a chat show which never went past the pilot stage. In her autobiography, Goodyear expresses real regret that this chat show, the Judy Goodyear show, never went anywhere. In typical fashion, she'd done a great deal of prep work and planning for it, and she couldn't understand why it wasn't picked up. She does provide us with an answer, though. Her friend, producer Andrea Waffner, told her that it is not in Granada's interests to allow you to be seen being successful in anything else. The argument being that if Goodyear left Coronation Street and she continued to find success in other projects, then it might inspire other actors on the soap to do the same. I'm not so sure it's as clear-cut as Granada's sabotage. Yes, it was the decision of Granada to kill her chat show. And yes, Granada also opted to cast Judy Walters instead of Judy Goodyear in a £2 million drama called Girls' Night Out. But while it makes an entertaining theory, I think it's safe to say that there were other factors at play. For a start, Waffner was not working for Granada at this point, 
And it seems like she was just theorising as a producer rather than revealing some deliberate strategy on the company's part. Secondly, while Junie Goodyear seems like an obvious chat show host in that she's friendly, entertaining, good with the crowd and has a wealth of life experiences to draw on, these things also work as a disadvantage. In a genre where the focus is meant to be on the guest, Junie Goodyear would almost certainly draw the attention. As a huge star in her own right and a natural performer, it would simply be in her nature to take the limelight. I just don't think she could help it. If you think about big, successful chat shows, the host is rarely a big personality for this exact reason. Thirdly, we have to take typecasting into account. Julie Goodyear did not have a single dramatic role between her 95 departure and 2001 return, likely due to the shadow of her most iconic character. After all, if you play the biggest character on one of the country's biggest shows for 25 years, then you are going to get typecast. It is at this point in Julie Goodyear's career that the offer came through to return to Coronation Street an offer she'd long claimed she'd turned down if presented with it. I don't think we can understand what came next without understanding that Julie Goodyear left Coronation Street in the hopes of finding success on the same level elsewhere, only to fall into the same old trap that so many actors fall into. Goodyear has always claimed that she returned as a favour to her beloved Coronation Street in its hour of need, but I'm not so sure. To put it bluntly, I do not believe that if Judy Goodyear had the opportunities she had assumed she'd have after she left Coronation Street, that she would have ever ignored her misgivings and changed her mind about making a return. Julie Goodyear returned to Coronation Street as much for reasons of career pragmatism as for reasons of loyalty. It must be strange watching the show in which you played such an integral part chug on without you. It must be strange to suddenly and dramatically fall out of the limelight for the first time in a quarter of a century. It's true that Coronation Street panicked and rushed back to the safety of its golden age. But the fact is, I think Julie Goodyear did too. Bet. Correct. Give that girl a coconut. Though it's always overshadowed by Goodyear's return to Corrie proper, in 1999, Bet Lynch returned to our screens in a one-off run of six episodes. Designed to bolster ITV's ratings after the news at 10 was temporarily removed from the schedule, After Hours was set in Brighton and focused on Bet, Vicky, Vicky's former boyfriend Steve McDonald and Reg Holdsworth, one of Coronation Street's greatest comedic characters. It's okay, there's some nice scenes between Vicky and Bet, and Bet and Reg have some really fun moments. The two have a fun back and forth that's very reminiscent of the one that made Bet and Alex so popular. I'm grateful to you for sticking your neck out. Let's just leave it at your neck for now, eh? Mr Latimer? It is Mr Latimer, isn't it? Oh, Bruce? Bruce! Oh. The real importance of After Hours, though, is that it lured Julie Goodyear back to Corrie. It was an enjoyable shoot, with scripts she's described as the best she had ever read. And she and Reg's actor, Ken Morley, had such a fun time that they ended up becoming good friends as a result. And so it was that despite lots of trepidation, Judy Goodyear agreed when asked to return to Coronation Street proper for a 12-month stint. Bette Lynch ostensibly returned to Coronation Street for Betty's retirement party, but it was soon revealed that she had actually returned to Weatherfield for a court case she and a number of others were bringing against her con man ex-boyfriend. After interacting with a few of the newer characters of the Rovers, Bet stays with Audrey, reminisces with Mike Baldwin, and has a difficult conversation with Rita that leaves the pair at loggerheads. There's a little more to the story than that for the reasons we shall soon see. And two weeks after she had arrived, Bet had left off screen, having lost the court case. The Bet. Absent friends, love. Well, she gone off again. Honestly, you never know where you are with that one. There are a number of problems that are very apparent watching Bet's 2001 return. The first is that it is terribly conceived. Writer John Stevenson was in charge of Bet's return, and his reasoning was that Bet would see returning to Weatherfield as a mark of failure. When I wrote Julie's comeback episodes, we wanted to use the feeling of failure that I'm back when I started in this little back street. As an idea, I honestly think it has some promise. Coronation Street has a long history of sending off characters to passages new, often in the back of a cab, and this is a nice little subversion of that. The problem is that this goes directly against the purposes of bringing Bet Lynch back. They wanted to bring back an immensely popular classic character, but wrote her in a completely different way. It is bizarre. Given the high profile nature of Julie Goodyear's return and its perceived importance to Coronation Street's future, ITV went all in on promoting it, including a very camp and very on tone advert. Life on the street is about to get even more interesting. You can bet your life on it. Coronation Street tomorrow at 7.30 and 8.30 here on UTV. This is the bet audiences expected, but it is not the bet they got. It's staggering just how different bet is. 
She's not the warm, fun, generous character she once was. Instead she's bitter and cynical and spends most of her time looking depressed and chain-smoking on Audrey's sofa. Bet was fun to watch. This is not fun. The look is all wrong too. The hair is different. The makeup and costume are off somewhat too. It reads as a deliberate choice to make Bet look wrong somehow. Weaponizing the style against the character so it plays into the bitter and jaded angle. Bet looks bad because she was supposed to look bad. And the performance is lacking because there is simply so little to work with. And the character is so different. As Ken Morley puts it. The old saying is, the best chef in Paris uh, can't make cakes from shit. And that's absolutely true, and I think what they gave to her was a load of shit. Another obvious problem is that Bet has very little to do. To a certain extent, we can't really blame anyone for this. Goodyear left early, before the storyline really got going. But on the other hand, there is a failing at play here. Bet's return was big news, and so Coronation Street wanted her in as many scenes as possible. But the storyline is so thin that we end up with a lot of scenes of Bet smoking, complaining, and telling people about her court case. It's an awful lot of nothing for something that was really hyped up. The interactions with the newer characters are a little strange too. In some ways it's pretty neat seeing these two different eras come together like this, but Bet never stops seeming out of place, and she doesn't quite belong. It doesn't help when other characters are dismissive of her, notably Janice Battersby. Hey Gail, who's the old slapper there, you know? <laughs> Stevenson has said that this line was written to give some voice and some acknowledgement to the critics of Bet Lynch's return, but I'm not so sure it's helpful to remind the viewers of the criticisms in the episode itself. There are things I like about this storyline. Well, alright, one thing. While Bet is staying with Audrey, Gail visits with Sarah and Sarah's baby Bethany. Oh, and this little one and all. Your mum never said out to me about you having her. Oh, no, Bethany's not mine. Oh, I'm sorry. She's not yours, I hope. Oh, Beth. <laughs> She's mine, actually. Yours? Yeah, Bethany's Sarah's little girl. Surprised me mum didn't tell you. No, no, she didn't tell me. Hey, I've just seen Sarah Platt's little lass. I couldn't believe my eyes. Why, oh, a lot come on since you went away, love. That's not just Bet reacting to Bethany. That's classic Coronation Street reacting to the direction new Coronation Street had moved in. It's a really nice little meta moment, but it's not enough to save these episodes. The reaction to the return was far from positive, most notably from the press who attacked Goodyear relentlessly, and whose criticism focused less on the quality of the storyline and more on the actress herself. Goodyear had always been a favourite target of the tabloids, and her return, rife for opportunity for massive embarrassment, was immediately set upon by the papers. By far the most popular topic was Goodyear's alleged unprofessionalism. Most of these stories apparently came from some of the younger cast members, who Piers Morgan revealed had been selling stories to the press at the time, and I can't say I don't understand why. These actors, whoever they were, were the face of modern Coronation Street, and in bringing back Judy Goodyear, they were now being told that they had failed, that the public didn't want to see them, and that Goodyear was going to save the show. Such was the fanfare from some parties involved in Coronation Street, that when Goodyear arrived for her first day of shooting, the crew played God Save the Queen. That kind of reception must have rankled. I honestly don't doubt there's some truth to these stories. Some of them have been outright confirmed, like the one about Norris Cole's actor, Malcolm Hebden, having to vacate his dressing room because Goodyear wanted it. But knowing Goodyear's history on the show, it seems more than likely that she might have been difficult. She'd been beyond deferential when she'd started. Perhaps it's possible she now felt entitled to a bit of that same deference from others. Goodyear was the biggest star in the soap's history, now come to save Coronation Street in its hour of need. Is it too much to believe that this might have gone to her head? For what it's worth, Julie Goodyear has dismissed these stories as completely untrue, but has also made a point to say that certain perks were missing from the show when she returned. I think it's fairly safe to say that these stories aren't completely untrue. There is another reason why Goodyear might have been difficult though. In fact, I dare say it was the biggest driver of any behind the scenes issue. Julie Goodyear was under an enormous amount of stress. A great deal had changed behind the scenes of Coronation Street since Goodyear had left in 95. For a start, more episodes were being produced. When Goodyear was a main cast member, it had been three a week. Now it was five, and it meant working six days a week. Rehearsal time was non-existent. Scenes were now filmed out of order as opposed to chronologically, which had been the case. Scripts changed regularly, and many of the older colleagues she'd worked with had gone. There was immense pressure on her to do a good job, with no lesser task than to save Coronation Street itself. And on top of all that, the press was out to get her. Anyone might have found this difficult, but for someone who had enjoyed a sense of friendship with her former cast members, and who had very much had her own strict and regimented way of working, it was disastrous. As Goodyear herself says, The team spirit and camaraderie that we'd all taken for granted when I was last there had gone. The sets were still the same, but everything else, the entire way of working, had completely changed. The makeup and costume departments were, compared to what they had been, virtually unexistent. As far as I was concerned, nobody could function effectively in that situation. It was mind-blowing, just like a conveyor belt. There was no laughter, no conversation, nothing. It just felt soulless, and certainly wasn't the place for me, and I knew it.
The older cast members had been there when these changes had been gradually introduced. The younger cast members had never known anything different, but Goodyear was thrown right into the middle of things. With a packed working schedule, full of empty scenes, playing a character that bore little resemblance to Bet, it was a disaster waiting to happen. Two weeks after she'd returned, the inevitable happened. Citing health reasons, Judy Goodyear left Coronation Street for the second time. The plan had been for Bet to accept an offer from Fred Elliott to take over as the new manager of the Rovers, but instead she lost her court case and left off screen. The press were ruthless, and still are. Whatever's happened to her is of her own making, and if she's not happy, I suspect that's more to do with her than anybody else. I'm a bitch. This really isn't fair, though. Goodyear had suffered from a mental breakdown in 1973, and had spent a month recovering in an institute as a result. She had a medical history that was now, rather understandably, beginning to flare up again. In hindsight, this was probably the only real ending that this first return would ever have. The best summary of this entire mess comes from Goodyear herself in her autobiography which details a conversation she had with executive producer Caroline Reynolds after Reynolds told her to, quote, think Beckham, who was himself going through a bad phase with the press. Goodyear responded, OK, I'm thinking Beckham, and shall I tell you what it feels like? I feel like I've got no fucking football boots on, I'm in the wrong fucking position, and I'm trying to stitch number seven on my own fucking back, while the rest of the team, who was supposed to be on my side, are kicking the fucking ball at me. <laughs> You'd be forgiven for thinking that this disaster marked the end of Goodyear's relationship with Coronation Street, but, believe it or not, Bet Lynch would return just one more time the very next year. Bet! The one and only. <laughs> Bet's second return in 2003 is probably what the first return ought to have been, and there are several reasons why it works better. Firstly, Coronation Street was in a much stronger position, with a hugely successful Richard Hillman storyline and Kieran Roberts' changes having brought the soap back from the brink, meaning there was substantially less pressure on Goodyear and less forced focus on Bet. Secondly, Goodyear made absolutely certain she had as much prior knowledge and control before she agreed to return again. Checking and rechecking everything she wanted and needed was in place. Thirdly, it was only ever meant as a seven episode run rather than a full time run. And fourthly, the powers that be had a very, very painful experience to learn from. They knew what not to do. The result is that we get a far more successful return. Bet Lynch actually seems like Bet Lynch again, fun and gregarious with the same hint of vulnerability that made her so popular. The episode takes place in Blackpool, where Liz McDonald and Fred Elliott bump into Bet, who now owns a bar in Brighton, at a brewery conference. From there, Bet mulls over a marriage proposal from Cecil Newton, George Baker, an old friend of the millionaire Newton of Newton and Ridley. Bet eventually agrees to marry Cecil, but only after his son has tried to warn his father off by presenting him with photos of Bet kissing Jim McDonald. This is husband who had escaped from prison, something she only did to help him hide from the police. In the final episode, and just before Bet's wedding, Cecil dies of a heart attack at the church, and Bet leaves Brighton with Liz. It's not the best story, and certainly can't be matched with Bet's original departure, but the characterisation and tone are right, and the story has a clearer focus, with Bet actually having something to do. Fred Elliott is great as always, Cecil and Bet's scenes are sweet, and there's some nice stuff in there about growing old alone, and though Bet's final scenes can't match her first final scenes, it's a really solid note to end on. Come on, Liz. Party going in Brighton. Got our name on it. Still, it's weird that she's introduced coming out of a public toilet stall. I mean, that's a choice, I guess. The return of Bet Lynch is much, much more than just an embarrassing footnote in Coronation Street history. It's the end result of Britain's biggest soap truly worrying about its place at the top for the first time. Coronation Street had endured weak points before this, of course, but the early 2000s was particularly bad, arguably the most vulnerable period it had ever experienced. Bringing back Bet Lynch was the result of a moment of intense panic, and its failure signifies just how much the soap had changed in only seven short years. Neither Coronation Street nor Julie Goodyear were really hurt in the long run by Bet's first return. Richard Hillman's success meant it was soon forgotten, and Coronation Street continued on a steady course from there on out. Goodyear, meanwhile, did a lot of reality TV work, including projects like Celebrity Fit Club, Celebrity Big Brother and Celebrity Come Dine With Me, the last of which reunited her with Ken Morley, and I honestly kind of recommend it because it does feel like a couple trapped in a loveless marriage having dinner with the newlyweds next door. Despite the difficulties of Goodyear's first return, and her persistent denial that she would ever come back to Coronation Street, rumours still persist that a third Bet Lynch return is just around the corner. 
and the character is still well loved, with 2001 acting only as an ugly blemish on her legacy. At the heart of this awkward footnote though is Judy Goodyear, and I don't think we can blame her too much for wanting to return to Coronation Street. After all, the street was Judy Goodyear's life, the focus of her sole ambition which she excelled not only by joining the cast permanently, but by becoming the biggest icon of her day. For 25 years it was her home away from home, and when it fell into a bad place, Goodyear was the one the producers contacted. After everything Coronation Street had given her, how could she refuse? How could any of us? Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please feel free to give it a like and subscribe to this channel for more soap content. I also have a Patreon, so if you want to make a small donation, it would really help this channel to grow. There's lots of rewards available, including voting on future videos as well as little supplemental essays on each month's topic, and any donation would be hugely appreciated. Links to my Patreon and Twitter can be found in this video's description, along with links to scenes and clips from this video's topic, and I highly encourage you to check those out. Thanks, bye!